of LA are you based in? Uh, I'm in Venice Beach. Ah, oh, happy days. Nice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if you're gonna uh, if you're gonna slug it out and hustle it out in LA, it's best to be in a nice spot. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. Yeah. I lived in New Zealand for a while, and there's a stat over there that the population increase goes up after a World Cup because everyone gets pregnant. <laughs> uh, got it. Celebrating. <laughs> yeah. And they say that the electricity spikes at half time for everyone putting the kettle on for a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's getting there slowly but surely but I, there's a long way to go trust me <laughs> we still say that you know the only culture they know is in yogurt <laughs> <laughs> nice. uh, that's a good one make sure you've got some water with you because it's always always <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, and, uh, so just out of interest is that that's the big that's the big, the big bertha. bertha and then that's the yeah. middle size there Nice. And then that's the the small one there. Mm. Oh, that's cool. um, oh. for traveling. Uh, depends on who you are. This is like perfect. Uh, women love this one. Yeah, cool. I just like to drink a lot of water, and I love my oh, rolling yeah. and stretching. So I don't care that it's bigger. Yeah. Um, men are usually fine, and it goes through airports fine as long as it's empty. Cool, cool. That was that was my question because we're going to be doing a lot of traveling, so. Um, oh, you need yeah. it. You need it in airports and stuff when you're delayed and layovers and stuff as well. It's like perfect for that. And refilling because the, the whole plastic bottle thing is a nightmare. Yeah. No. So, um, <laughs> yeah, entrepreneurialism is a good weight loss diet. <laughs> it is, eh? <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, cool so stuff. you have a Sharon, um, a Sharon yeah. football up there. Are you yeah. an AFL supporter? No, I used to play Aussie Rules. I played it for about no way. Uh, ten years. Yeah, yeah, here in the UK. So. Oh, um, cool. So yeah, who do you support? Uh, to be honest with you, like I kind of like I, I I was kind of thrown in with the Tigers. Like that's who ah, the guys okay. I, I first started living with in yeah. London. They were all big Tiger supporters. So so I'd say they probably the people I support because I just. I, I like those blokes. So I like them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It <laughs> doesn't matter where you go. It's the, the, there's always that reputation with the Aussies. They're like, oh, you guys know how to party and you know how to drink. and <laughs> Take things too far. <laughs> That's true as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, then, and then it's funny. All my Aussie mates always go, no, you should see the Kiwis. They're really bad. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I was thinking before this, like, is Lani, because in South Africa, when you say Lani, like we say. Oh, hang on. I know this one. It's oh, like, you know it. <laughs> hang on, hang on. No. No, they did. The boys told me um, it's really bad. No, 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 it's not. Isn't it? Lani no, is like no, a something no. bad. Like a gangster, affectionate term, like a. Oh no, I I didn't think it was. That. I think when someone when something's Lani, it's like it's pretty. Oh, like, like that, Lani. Yeah, like okay. that, like, like Lani. It's, <laughs> oh, okay, no, no, no. When someone when someone says it's Lani, it's like it's kind mm. of like uh, posh or, yeah. or something oh. like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, they must have been giving me shit. I would play some um, beach touch rugby with some boys. There's a lot of South Africans down there, and um, yeah. they must have just been giving me shit. Probably, <laughs> yeah, <it's>, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Put Probably me off my it game. Sounds like South Africans. Yeah, it sounds like exactly. dodgy buggers. <laughs> <laughs> Okie dokie there. Good afternoon there, Lani Cooper, coming in live from Venice Beach in LA. Gee, we, thank you so much for joining us on the Ridiculous Human Podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no, we're super yeah, excited um, to, we're super excited to speak to you. We actually uh, got put in touch with you uh, by a previous guest of ours, Karen Millsap. Um, she heard you on, a, on another podcast called People Being Real. And uh, she's like, you have to speak to this lady. She's amazing. So I'm not sure if you if you know each other, or it's just great that she mentioned you. I didn't. I looked up. I looked her up after you told me that, and I was. It was. It was very cool. It was very nice. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. No. She's she's such an incredible lady. Um, if yeah. You, if you get a chance to listen to a podcast, though, wow, she's really rather inspirational. That's for sure. I definitely watched a lot of her videos after that. They're very inspirational. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Such yeah, a smart, yeah. articulate woman. Hey, wow. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so, um, you know, like we said, we're super excited to, to speak with you. You have such an amazing story. Seriously, there's so many parts to it. So we cannot wait to basically delve into it. Um, but maybe we can just take it back to the beginning. Uh, you obviously grew up uh, on the Goldie in Australia. And um, you, you were 
quite an introverted child that's like uh, you're born and I guess your family was quite extroverted. Uh, so how was that for you? And maybe you can just tell us a little bit about uh, your childhood. I think that um, I grew up uh, more west of the Gold Coast and then ended up on the Gold Coast. So, um, and it was uh, a lot of, you know, I was around a lot of boys and um, I don't know if I was just introverted or just that they were so intense and raw, which a lot of Aussie men are. Um, so you just kind of take a back seat to that. And, um, and then I was always seeing them play sports and playing sport and love playing sport. Of course, my dad wanted a boy first and he got me. So until my brothers came along, I was, you know, rugby, water skiing, barefooting, all the, all the things that the boys should do. Um, and then the boys came along, so they, they did it more, but I still had the skills to, and I guess I started to incite more of a interest into that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, we had a sort of, my dad got quite sick and um, we pretty much lost everything, the, the house and um, his job, his business and all that kind of stuff. My brothers were quite young and mum had to take on, you know, many jobs and he was in and out of hospital for quite some time. And I was quite young and um, I didn't realise the impact on me then, um, which sort of turned me, I think, more um, introverted because I was... I was getting bullied at, at school and then bullied all around the place for, for things until we ended up moving out to the country. And uh, it's, it's sort of, uh, I think sometimes, and that's what I was recognising actually the, just the other day, is that when your back gets pushed up against the wall for long enough, eventually for some people at some point you're going to like burst out. And so uh, hormones helped me do that around uh, 13. <laughs> I was like, right, I've had enough. And um, I started, I turned that into a, a quite the uh, rebellious situation. So I am now a very good problem solver because I was very good at creating problems previously. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what sort of stuff were you getting bullied for? Um, so I grew up as a Jehovah's Witness and so that um, even still I guess today <clears throat> any kind of religion is um, is still there's not a lot of understanding um, around it so I was being bullied for that um, I had turned to food for comfort with everything that the loss in my family and the illnesses and stuff like that so I had put on a lot of weight so I became quite a chubby kid and um, I wouldn't even say I was fat. There's still always like growing pains at that age, but kids can be so cruel. So I was bullied for, you know, my appearance and my size and um, being poor and being a Jehovah's Witness that, and just all kinds of things. And then going home, the support wasn't there from my family, just in the sense of being sensitive enough to be aware of it from a girl's point of view, because there were so many men around and my parents were so busy trying to survive and keep everything together. So, um, I had to pretty much take care of myself and to take care of myself in my own way, I realized that, you know, the cool, tough kids didn't, they seemed to be doing pretty good. Mm -hmm. I'm like, maybe I should join them. <laughs> yeah. And, it's and, tough sometimes and, being a youngster like that. Hey, like just, uh, you just, I mean, people can be so cruel sometimes without even realizing it. And, and oftentimes you don't realize how much someone else is taking that on board. And uh, it's, it's going to be such a tough environment. Now, now, Lani, you spoke about, you touched on it a bit, this sort of masculine, don't speak country, Australia. You know, there's this sort of this feeling that, that, that exists there. Um, it's something that you obviously battled with and, and you mentioned not really having the support. So did you have any sort of female role models to, to guide you at all? Not really. I mean, my mum was... Um, uh, a lovely pillar of strength, like just a great hardworking woman keeping it all together while all that was going on. But as uh, I definitely saw what she was going through and went, I don't want that. <laughs> I don't want to be sort of submissive and I don't want to be overburdened with the, the traditional roles that uh, were for, forced upon women then, I guess, and uh, not being able to get like, go to finish a degree or go to college and things like that. Um, so I guess I saw what I didn't want, but no, there wasn't a lot of female role models. My dad had five brothers. My mum had three brothers. Um, they all had a lot of boys. And um, so when we'd go away as a big family together, it was pretty much the, the boys and me. And for some reason, 
there's something in me that just wanted to do what they do. I didn't see why I couldn't do what they were do, mm. doing, um, from, you know, uh, barefooting to rugby to anything like that, boxing. And, but they were quite adamant that I couldn't do it because I was a girl. Mm. And uh, that fueled my fire a little bit. And um, <clears throat> I'm grateful for that now because that's, uh, that's a big part of who I am. And I don't think they were aware how much that was affecting me or that they were doing anything wrong. That was just a, a normal way of thinking. It's mm. interesting now that like, I meet, um, you know, people, men, things like that. And they're like, oh, you're Australian. Australian women are tough. <laughs> like, um, yeah, have you seen what we have to compete with? You kind of have to be one of the boys kind of to be accepted and, and, you know, pulled into the group and be cool. And, and I do, uh, they'll generally, um, once you prove yourself, they'll take you under your, their wing and they're really good at mateship and they're like some of my best mates and I love them to pieces. And um, it's not a bad thing, but once you really step up and they, they will acknowledge it, which is what's great, but you have to, you have to earn your, your mates and your uh, group over there, that's for sure. <laughs> and, and and do you think that's changing a little bit that sort of environment or that uh, undertone or um, undercurrent let's say of, of this masculinity in Australia um I think so I um I definitely see more so particularly like being in the health and fitness industry and being a lot involved with social media and Instagram and that that um, there is a lot more women from um, Australia doing so well and promoting health and wellness and doing it in quite a, a cool feminine way. And I think they really are doing themselves. They're doing an amazing job of yeah. um, pushing that forward. I haven't lived there for so long, so I, I probably couldn't speak to it fully. Um, but I do know that it is, it is definitely changing. And um, I know more people are talking about um, speaking up because in, in the past we've had a lot of obviously um, problems with suicide for that reason, um, for you know men not speaking up. So men are supporting each other and getting together in groups to help each other know that speaking up or talking about your problems and not suffering it alone is, mm. is okay. It's not just for the women, it's for all of us. So I think, you know, uh, not just um, equality on, you know, pay and things like that, equality on what we get to share with each mm. other is that we, you know, we can help each other out. Yeah. It's great yeah, to so see these shifts in like, you know, how we behave as a society. It's really quite promising, actually. Uh, yeah. Still early days, but, <laughs> but there's, there's a lot of, I think, hope and, and a good shift in, in what we're seeing. Uh, just out of interest, do, do you find like these days that you kind of gravitate more to men or to women, like in terms of friends? I definitely have more male friends. Um, unfortunately, most of them get left in the friend zone, uh, which becomes rather <laughs> difficult in your 40s. Um, but I'm definitely more the kind of person that is um, not aggressive, but I'm more upfront, honest, ready to deal with it, tackle it head on, put it aside and move forward. I'm not a very, I don't hold grudges and things like that. I still love to talk to my girlfriends and chat about it. And, you know, they're a great community for me and I love them. Um, but I, I definitely, I think because I had so much of a male dominant background and I know, I know a little too much about things that probably girls should, shouldn't know about. Like we used to do time trials on uh, changing tires and um, I just, and people are like, you know how to do all this stuff? Awesome. I'm like, yeah, I'm under seven minutes, like from, you know, Whoa. flat tire to go. And like, <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> well, you've That's definitely cool. changed a lot more tires than me in my life. I can promise you that. <laughs> Oh, classic. So, so sorry, just out of interest, um, are you still Jehovah now? Do you practice, um, you know, Jehovah Witness? No, um, I was probably a re rebellious enough that my mom at 16 was like, I can see this isn't really working out for you. Um, do you want to choose to be one or not? And I was like, I choose not. Because <laughs> I was like running away. I was doing all sorts of things. Um, so I haven't been since I was 16, but um, it had quite an impact on my life because it was, uh, so from such a young age, it took me many years to unwind all that stuff in my brain. It was um, unfortunately kind of like um, a brainwashing and, and I had a lot of guilt and a lot of fear and a lot of uncertainty around what was right, what was wrong, am I good, am I bad, like all that kind of stuff. Um, my family is still Jehovah's Witnesses and um, they're doing great. My brothers were so young, they grew up in it, so I don't think they knew any different, whereas I didn't. 
um, but it's not it's not for everyone. I can totally see why my my mum went to it and my family, and it works for them. It just mm-hmm. um, it does. I have faith, but that that doesn't work for me. Yeah, yeah. So, so sorry. Were you allowed to like celebrate your birthday growing up? I mean, I know. I think yeah, that's. So I'm only yeah. twelve. Um, <laughs> 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 I didn't actually have the courage to celebrate my birthday for the until I was uh, I think thirty. Wow. Like what? Sing happy birthday um, because there was such um, fear and guilt thrown on you about having a birthday. And uh, being the entrepreneur that uh, I am, I think from a very young age, I think I think I was in early teens, and I was like, well, this isn't just right. You should be celebrating someone's birth. It's joyous. And I'm like, that's it. I'm going to change it to happy, glad you were born day. I'm going to make mugs and hats and shirts. I'm going to sell it to all the Jehovah's Witnesses. (laughs) (laughs) That was your first bankruptcy. (laughs) (laughs) That's so funny. I love that. That's great. Um, So yeah, so you mentioned, obviously you hung out with the boys and I think as a result of that, you kind of like suppressed your feelings in, in some sort of way. Um, but you you also had a different outlet, you know, and, and you mentioned you know eating disorder, and uh, you also uh, you you know had suffered from depression, I think, as a result of of some of that stuff. So maybe you can just sort of tell us, like, you know, what what happened there, and um, you know about the intervention that you eventually had to have from your friends. Yeah, I think I I definitely confused that um, to be accepted. I had to be like them instead of being myself and who I am and owning my feminine power and blending the both, which is what gratefully I, I do now. Um, but yeah, it went internal and um, I honestly didn't know I had an eating disorder or a problem or even a drug addiction. I didn't even really know. I um, really just thought I had no willpower. I was just such a determined little shit that <laughs> um, I was just like, okay, well, if I do this, it kind of, I thought it was logical if I don't eat and I exercise this much, I'll get to this weight. And then, and now looking back, I know it was all about, you know, control and trying to control an external um, thing because I control my internal um, or my environment around me. Um, It turns out like definitely getting through that, that was the start of uh, me going on that uh, journey of self-discovery and what was going on and why. And I was um, super grateful for the intervention that young. So I had some very difficult days ahead of me to recover from that kind of stuff. And, um, but it's, it's changed my life to um, have gone through that. Then uh, the flip side of that now is uh, things are a little bit easier rather than, um, I guess, uh, I think, and I've said it before is having that adversity so young and then creating that resilience because as you get older, things don't get easier, it becomes more intense and it's easier to face it when you've got that, um, when you've fought something before and one, you know, you can, so you, it's easy to keep fighting. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so definitely, um, taught me a lot about that. And that got my interest in once I discovered things and got better, I was like, wow, do other people know this? Can I, how can I help someone else? So I started volunteering in, in clinics and that sort of started my journey. Hmm. That's incredible. And maybe go for it again. No, no, I was just, I was just going to say, um, you, you, you obviously had like some strong friends for them to, you know, to intervene and like say this to you, because I guess, I don't know, like sometimes mates don't always say that they kind of like, um, just go along with things and, you know, that's actually really funny because um, <laughs> they were uh, roommates and they were sick of my behaviour and they were going to kick me out. So <laughs> ah, <okay. laughs> and, and they were, they were very strong, um, you know, independent women. And they're just like, they saw me every day. I uh, was so good at hiding it that my, none of my mates actually knew. Even when I went out, ended up in hospital, they um, said most of them didn't really know what was going on. So, and that's a big part of it that, you know, people tend to hide it. I guess you could see it, but um, I didn't try and show any signs of it or that I was suffering in public to anyone that I knew. Whereas because they lived with me and I chose to live with people I didn't know for that reason, um, yeah, they were um, uh, a huge factor in in me getting help. And Lani, did you have this sort of awareness that you had that you had an eating disorder at the time, or was it? Do you know what I mean? I, I, we've heard we've chatted to people before that. Some people kind of knew they were controlling uh, what they were eating and there was a sort of an awareness and other people were just kind of went down this pathway. Where, where did you fit in on that sort of spectrum? 
Yeah, no idea. I just thought I had um, low, like no willpower or self control. I was just, I was, I've always been very hard on myself, and uh, my dad's very hard on himself, and he was very hard on us. So you know, in, you know, uh, not good enough had to be better. So I guess you start to take on a little bit of your environment, and then you just sort of hear things um, in general in passing, particularly like about women that you know can't do this you can't do that so I'm like oh my god I have to I have to be thinner I have to be stronger I have to be prettier no I can't be prettier it's just like this big confusing game so I was extremely hard on myself and I really honestly just thought I had no willpower and and anorexia itself maybe you could just tell us a little bit because apparently what I've read and stuff is it's one of the sort of hardest things for people to to kick um maybe you could just tell us a little bit about what it is like just so people that aren't maybe sure. Yeah, it's, um, oh gosh, um, going back so long now. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, and it, it's almost like an, it's an addiction and um, it's definitely like um, mentally affects you as well. And I think, I personally think you have to lean a little bit that way, either uh, chemically as well. And then once you go so far, I think you're in it. So um, I don't know if you guys have heard and might be going too far. And um, But have you heard of something called pyral urea or yes. cryptopyrals? Yeah. So it wasn't till decades later that um, another sort of unfortunate thing, and I got tested for that and I was positive for that. And um and for those that don't know, that's just sort of an underlying issue for a lot of um, mental illness and things like that. But it has to be, it's like your environment, you have to have the precursors for it, all these things. And then once you check the box in chemically, it's checked on. So my dad is positive for it and my brothers are like, ha- like have it, but it's not turned on. So mine, obviously my childhood stress was enough to flick the switch. And they say that that um, doesn't help, especially if you're not aware. And um, add to that that I didn't realise that, um, gosh, and this is, wow, I can't believe I'm going into this. Um, <laughs> uh, this uh, they used to have travelling dentists that used to come to your school and do your fillings for free. And I had a tooth that wasn't encapsulated properly. So over the years, it was leaching. Uh, mm-hmm. what, may, what made that a little bit worse was that having had an eating disorder and not eating enough fat or protein for the mercury to bind to, to come out of the body, it was actually spreading through my body so that it's hard to say whether it was me, the mercury, what it was that actually made it worse um, for me, like almost like psychologically to to take that as far as I did um, and become so obsessed and um, good at it, unfortunately. (laughs) (laughs) Wow, that's fascinating. No, well, thanks for sharing that. I think it's, I think it's quite a prevalent thing. And I know you mentioned social media. Lots of people are at least talking about it more these days and making young young girls, especially, but it's boys too, um, aware of these things because there are there is help, and you know you can get through things like this, you know, and have a thriving life. I think a lot of people when they're in that moment probably don't feel like that, you know. So, it's really gripping when you're in it that um, I've read letters from when I had to get up and speak at the uh, end of your sort of, um, I guess, graduation from the centre to be able to leave, like what you've achieved, what your plans are, what you're going to do, what you've acknowledged, all that kind of stuff, kind of like AA. And um, I found the letters and I was like, this poor girl's lying to herself. Wow. Like I read the letters like 10 years ago about who, what I learned, what I was going to do, what I got out of it. And um, it would have been, I would say it was at least um, 10 years uh, after and not to put anyone off, but to completely feel uh, comfortable that um, even if it's still in there, I am okay with it. Like it doesn't trigger me anymore. And, and that's the hardest part. Sometimes it just, it doesn't go away. You get better at, at choosing to live healthy instead of that. Like that doesn't um, fuel you anymore. Hmm. Yeah. I think it's super valuable. Yeah. I think it's, it's so, I think it's so important for us to like acknowledge that a, a lot of like eating disorders are actually, um, you know, sort of mental things that we really need to, you know, we, we, we need to understand that, you know, to actually help people 
um, and, and be more compassionate, you know what I mean? Uh, to, to help them recover because, mm. you know, there, there's often these stigmas attached with, you know, maybe people that say, oh, obese or anorexic that like, you know, you just got to flip and get over it sort of thing, but it's not like that. It's actually, it's much deeper, you know, in terms of like actually recovering from it. So yeah. Wow. Interesting. I do remember, um, a trigger and I guess, um, you know, back in the day, um, men, um, <laughs> but, uh, when I uh, got chubby and I turned to food, my dad was just like, you've gotten fat, you should stop eating. And I was like, Oh, okay. And then, um, when the sort of the height of the anorexia sort of set in, cause it, that was about 10. And then, um, I was, got lost a lot of weight. So by about, I'd say 12, it was about 13. And he's like, you're too skinny. You need to eat something. I'm like, I'm so confused right now. Yeah. And that's when it was became more bulimia because I was like, okay, so I'll eat. But then because I'd ruined my system from being anorexic, my body just wouldn't take the food properly. I had no sort of health or nutrition support or idea. I couldn't Google anything. Um, so that's when those sort of played a role in joining forces for the next mm. sort of several years. Wow. Yes, that's Goodness, young. Sonny. Sure. Oh, it's so young, yeah. <laughs> Mm. And, um, but turning to, to something else, you, you eventually got stuck into yoga, which is, uh, which is really cool. But, but initially you actually didn't like it. You actually hated it. Um, which is, which is quite fascinating actually, but you have a three rule before giving up. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit about that. I think I'm obsessed with the number three. So yeah, it's like three times or three weeks or 30 days or something like that. Um, uh, three excuses and I'm like, we're done here. Um, <laughs> yeah, when I first, um, I don't know when it first started happening, but I think because I'm so hard on my myself, but I also know that it takes a little more to, you know, be good at something and, and you've got to make your focus. Like they say the 10,000 hours on something you can't, and you can't just sit there and watch something and say, I've seen that I could do it. Like, man, eh, have you done it? And have you committed like the, the reasonable amount of time to say, I gave that a red hot go. Okay. That's not for me. And I really don't like failing or quitting or anything like that. So um, when yoga came into my life and it really challenged me because at the time um, and the same sort of thing with eating disorders, you're in your head a lot, which a lot of people are these days, they're stressed out. So the fear that comes when you slow down because you've got to actually hear yourself and listen to yourself and then the thoughts feel like they're getting more. And that's sort of the point of meditation is to, and yoga is to try and like, you know, slowly start to calm those things down so you can have have more breathing space um, initially because I was so young and just sort of coming out of recovery that was too much and it was like oh, I need to move faster I need to run I need to lift weights I need to like go crazy um, but um, luckily there was a woman next to me that she was doing amazing and I'm like hang on like I am super competitive I was like Okay, I'm going to give myself a um, few weeks. I am going to come every day. I'm going to do it next year. I'm going to be like that. And yeah, within a few weeks, I started to adapt and really embody it and started to feel a lot better. And that's when the teacher was like, oh, I love your commitment. I'm like, I'm not committed. I'm just competitive. I, want to win. <laughs> I need to win. <laughs> And then, and then she asked you to take over her classes or something, didn't she, or your yoga teacher? Yeah, yeah, while well, she was away. And this is um, out the back, uh, way out the back of um, between Brisbane and the Gold Coast. And um, I was like, sure, I'm, I'm definitely one to, to say yes. And, you know, um, I feel foolish. And I've been, I think that sometimes if you can take uh, a positive out of a negative is that the bullying got me to a point where I was like, I've been at some of the lowest points so young. Uh, what's the worst that can happen? People are going to laugh at me. People are going to bully at me. I've had that. I've done that. Sure, let's try it sort of thing. So um, that's what I, I also hope when I like, you know, chatting with people on podcasts that, that they can take something out that like school doesn't last forever. Uh, hang in there and it will become, it becomes your, your strength because it doesn't happen again. You just, you definitely find ways to stand up for yourself. And um, I think when opportunities started to come like that, I was like, yeah, what have I got to lose? Yeah, yeah. for sure. And, and that's an important thing to remember. And that girl that uh, you're a competitor with, is, is she uh, <laughs> still someone that you're in touch with these days? No, I don't remember her name. <laughs> I, I don't think I ever spoke to her. I like to keep my competitiveness a secret. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, so, and usually when I win, it's not like me going, oh my God, I beat you in, inside. I'm like, okay, you, di- you, di- you did it. You did good. <laughs> uh, and where was classic. this, uh, Lani, where, where you said, you know, Brisbane? Um, have you heard of a place called Jimboomba? Oh, Jimboomba, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. But we're what talking Jimboomba. Um, <laughs> uh, out that way, it wasn't, it's further than that, but um, and what, 20 something years ago. So it was just, you know, trees Small. and one shop. Uh, a, a chicken shop that I worked in. That was my first job. <laughs> first real <paid> job. <laughs> classic. Oh, classic. It, but that's, it's interesting that you like, I mean, yoga, obviously yoga has been around thousands of years, but um, you know, it's only kind of like, I guess in the Western world come to the sort of forefront in the last, I don't know what, maybe 10, 15 years. So, mm. which was like right in its kind of infancy of being popular when you started doing it. Yeah, my, um, I still remember that when I said I was doing it and, you know, wanted to pursue it and maybe become a teacher and all that kind of stuff. And at the time you, you, to do a certification back then, you had to, you know, give up alcohol and be vegan and all that kind of stuff. It was very strict. And, um, my mom thought I was into some crazy new religion and probably Mm -hmm. needed an exorcism. (laughs) I was like, oh, okay, cool. I'm on the right path. I'm annoying my mum. I'll do it. <laughs> uh, that's great. Like any good daughter should, you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> exactly. uh, classic. So, so you talk about yoga saving you, but another thing that saved you uh, by the sounds of it was water, right? And, and you took a really big interest in water and hydration. Maybe you can tell us like a little bit about that, but then also what is the importance of water? You know, I don't, I don't think people actually really give it enough uh, yeah, importance in their own lives, you know? Right. It's sort of, um, undervalued. And I think because we've got so many, uh, other options that taste better than water, we've sort of gone, gone away from it. And I guess I went towards it, um, in, you know, in the liters, uh, because it was calorie free. So, um, that has, a uh, one of the doctors sort of said back then, because I drank so much water, it did, it did help me more, um, than having the sort of eating disorder affect me as bad as it could have. Um, and then I, I noticed when I started uh, studying the body and working with other people and trying to get them to drink more water, how um how quickly they notice a big difference and and i mean apart from like headaches and things like that that um you know not waking up with puffy eyes um being able to go to the the toilet easier things like that we are um and no one wants to talk about that uh shit literally (laughs) And, uh, (laughs) and um even just like simple things like most people like we're saying before about you know fall into an eating disorder, it starts from wanting to be healthier and then you see results, you get obsessed and then you take it too far. And then that is usually when people start to learn about hydration or unfortunately they get sick and then they need to learn about, you know, what they need to do for their body and, you know, hydration, nutrition, movement and and breath work is sort of a big part of that. Um, And then when I moved into working with more um, uh, athletes, uh, obviously they to perform at an optimal level, like they're hydration and also just making sure because there's intracellular and extracellular hydration making sure they're having the right nutrients to take it in through to the cells so that they're I mean what are we over 70 percent water and um, for me I like think about I like to think about things on a you know get outside the box and on a bigger scale and um, I think I've talked about this before where I probably made myself a sound a little hippie stupid but whatever but just the fact that the moon and every we know everything is energy it can pull the tide and it's water and things like that and then there what's that japanese doctor that was studying uh water and the effects of water from Uh, bad or good on it dr azamarato is it or um oh i've had a mental blank uh he passed away recently but um his studies were phenomenal and showing about how how what we think, what we say, even what we label our things with, how, and uh, how it can affect the water that goes in, not just into our body, but the, the cells in the water that's in our body. That it, it's a carrier for everything that we have for our nutrients. And I mean, that's why even with the the product I created, I put like I'll put a heart on it, or I'll put some little message somewhere that's like making sure that there's positive energy going into what you're drinking from because I feel like every every little bit matters that can help us overcome you know these boring things that we kind of resist and that was the biggest thing I noticed is the resistance to drinking water was um 
painful. And um, I think it's over 75% of Americans are, are chronically dehydrated. And they say that's one of the leading causes of, in, of illness. And then they're prescribed medication that dehydrates them more. And, and even more importantly, I don't think people know what dehydrates them as to how much they then have to top up not just starting it, oh, you need, say, two litres of water for your body weight. What else are you having that's taking that away, like sugar, caffeine, you know, prescription drugs and things like that? Yeah, it's, it's so... Alcohol. Yeah, 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 it's so yeah. important, like water, you know, and uh, I, I'm going to have to sort of replay this to my missus because every morning I have to have a battle with her. I'm like, have you drunk your water yet? You go and drink your water. water. <laughs> Only when you drunk your water can you have coffee. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and she's probably rolling her eyes now hearing me say this. But <laughs> um, actually, we, we, we must um, introduce you to a previous guest of ours. His name is Darren Olin, and he... Um, He's massive into his water. Um, actually, he lives he lives uh, in uh, LA as well, and um, he he like makes his own water basically. Uh, and uh, when he goes traveling, like one of his big things in his luggage is like his water maker. And uh, yeah, he's just he exactly like what you said. He's like he's, there's intracellular and extracellular and all these sort of things. And it's um, you know, when we when we yeah, when we start understanding how important this stuff is, you know, like uh, hopefully more and more people take a, a lot more interest in, you know, in just doing something that's simple. Seriously, it, it's so simple. It's like sleep, you know. We, it's these simple things which are just natural remedies, but we don't want to do them. We want to flip and throw tablets down our our throats. It's just crazy. Exactly. Well, it's it? kind of um, most of the time it's just it's boring and it seems too easy. It's like that, mm. that no, there must it must be something else that's too easy. And you're like, no, 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 that that's pretty much it. And I <laughs> always tell people, like if they say I'm hungry or a headache or even before your massages and things like that, make sure you have some water and then let me know sort of how you go. And most of the time, yeah, you're not you're not hungry. Um I some I say most of the uh angry people, when someone's angry, I'm like you're just dehydrated. Like <laughs> anyone that's agitated, when you need some water, <laughs> throw some throw some water on that fire. There, it's <laughs> right. <laughs> Your cells but, are like, oh my god. Totally, totally. I, I was wondering, maybe you could just uh, give us some thoughts on like the, the, this because water is becoming a more like let's say scientific thing, and and people mm. love to maybe complicate things a little bit again. But we also live in an environment where there is pollution. There's um, there are things like, uh, um, yeah, things going into our water that maybe we don't want. What are your thoughts on like filtering, but also on, uh, things like ionized water and these other kinds of water that you get? Do you have any like things that or take homes that we can like start with to maybe start drinking better water? Yeah, I mean, I over here I get reverse osmosis water. Um, the thing I I think about when they say they're taking all these things out, which are, you know, your fluorides and different things like that are in the water, is um, does it make it then uh, what's called hard water and it then um, is not being replenished with the, the minerals and the nutrients that the body needs to use because that's just as det detrimental having water that's then got sort of nothing in it for the body to actually use. So um, I'm a big fan of um, using, I put a lot of supplements like hydrate, um, I think they're called hydro tabs or, you know, just magnesium and things like that. I have um, a lot of sea salt that if I have a craving um, for particularly chocolate or sweets or something like that, I'll get a little bit of Celtic or Himalayan sea salt and stick a little bit under my tongue. And that will usually try to help balance it out, particularly if you're finding that the water is not replenishing you enough. And that's where if you're drinking a lot of water and it's not going in or you're peeing it straight out, um, that's when you need to see someone because it could be something more like, you know, uh, diabetes or you've got mineral loss where the, the water's not um, uh, nutrient dense enough technically if it's become too hard. Hmm. Oh, that's, and, and fluoride and stuff, should we, should we be filtering the stuff out? In, in my opinion, yes. I believe, um, and this is just my opinion, that the fluoride that they're putting in there is not the fluoride that's going to help our teeth and things like that. I think it's a byproduct of something else that they're trying to get rid of. And I uh, could go deep into political conspiracy theories, but I probably shouldn't. I'll save that for uh, when I have more money to defend myself <laughs> from the week. 
Um, <laughs> no, in my opinion, I, I'm not a fan. Okay, well, we'll we'll leave that for another podcast. But <laughs> you're at, you're an interesting rabbit hole to go down there, right? <laughs> so, so basically, at um, at what point do you become interested in trigger point therapy and uh, self myofascial release, and um, yeah, helping people with recovery? Yeah, I think after um, coming out of the eating disorder and and have and going through so many different things to peel back layers and find out what was really going on. From my childhood, so like obviously um, physical, emotional, mental traumas can live in your body. So I was finding myself uh, with a lot of injuries and a lot of muscle pain and my dad with fibromyalgia. um, So I felt like I was having sort of similar symptoms. And then I would say I was misdiagnosed at the time. It was more... um, in my opinion, a toxicity thing from everything that I was going through I was having a lot of muscle pain. So I was uh, started studying to help my dad initially and then um, also help myself. And that's when I started uh, learning about it to, to help myself. And I really just started, it was nothing back then. Like 20 years ago, we had golf balls and tennis balls and cricket balls. <laughs> Um, and you're probably using something similar to a pool no- noodle or um, rolling a, like your back on a handrail or something like that. Whenever you... <laughs> um, but I was I was in a lot of chronic pain and um, I almost couldn't function without doing that daily. And then as I was like studying and coming out and working with more athletes, I really noticed a difference uh, in the athletes, not just in their body, but in their confidence within themselves and knowing themselves of the ones that went home and did their rehab with this. And that's when I started getting interested in somatic therapy. I don't know if you've heard of that, Mm -hmm. uh, which is more you use, um, you know, actions and physical release to release trauma uh, at the same time as you're doing something with your body. Um, And and that's where I sort of put two and two together. I went, okay, they're kind of doing this on a, on a low level themselves because when you find a trigger point, you have to breathe really deep to release it. You know when you found it because you pull that face, you make that noise. Yeah. <laughs> and, then you, you know, and then after 30 seconds to a minute, you breathe through it and it's released and you feel better. You've got better range of motion. So there was kind of immediate evidence that it worked and um, once I started noticing that um, also that these athletes that their mindset their calmness um, was just different uh, in a in a way that I uh, I couldn't explain at the time Um, so I just I just became obsessed with it for my own I always love to you know get better and learn something and I'm very you know curious person and if there's a problem that someone's having, then I would like to try and solve it. And particularly when you're seeing people regularly and then you're not seeing the results. Um, Sure, I love being paid by the hour to see someone, you know, a couple of times a week or whatever. But uh, for me, if you're not able to walk away and be able to uh, see me less or uh, see, you know, make the practitioner work for you in getting better, uh, I always want to dig deeper and go, okay, what, what's going on when you're at home or what, what can you do in between that's going to sort of make this uh, work partnership work better? And, and it was quite a few years of, you know, delving in and out of it before I was like, holy moly, this is like, um, this is really something that not just athletes can use that I was using it when I was working in addiction centers and for rehabilitation for anything. And before and after yoga, we do a rolling session and, by the end of it, people were just um, talking about anything and everything. They were more open. They were more relaxed. You see people's faces change. And I was like, and like water, I was like, could it be that simple? But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this could really help people that much. Yeah, it's incredible. Eh? It's, it is incredible like how the simple things really make such a big difference and, and, and how there's that resistance not to do them. Like, I mean, if you... If you, if you like tell some guy to go to the gym and he's a big bodybuilder and stuff and like you say, you know what, you should actually maybe spend the first 10 minutes on the, on the roller just to kind of loosen your muscles up and stuff. They'll go, don't be stupid. Do you know what I mean? Like right. it, it, it literally is the simple stuff that that's sort of like so important for us. Um, exactly. So, so what, what were like, what were you actually doing? You mentioned working like the rehabilitation centers and this, what, what was your actual role uh, at this stage? Um, So I I, uh, went to study uh, physical therapy and um, I love anatomy and physiology, but it was um, quite a male dominated industry and it was, it felt quite, um, 
is it single focused on just looking at the, the muscle and fix it, fixing the problem where you see it? Whereas for me, I was like, what are they thinking? What happened in their life? What are they eating? Um, what's their stress levels to affect that injury? Is there a weakness coming from somewhere else? My brain sort of just went crazy. So I studied remedial and sport therapy. And then, um, and then I just continued other studies from uh, NLP, hypnosis, um, all, all that kind of stuff over many years. And so I was working in uh, centers in Thailand that incorporated um, it was usually a, uh, a detox program. So uh, you could do a fasting one, you could do raw food, you could, you know, and building up. And so there was a lot of people with uh, injury, illness, uh, recovering from cancer, uh, diabetes, obesity, things like that. And people would come anywhere from a week to three months, uh, depending on the level of what they needed. And uh, that um, seeing that many people from so many different walks of life, they're coming from all over the world because obviously it was a lot cheaper to stay in Thailand and do that kind of, you know, alternative therapy. And there's, there's so many options there for a long time. And I got to see, I feel like everything, <laughs> <laughs> just about everything um, and see what worked and what didn't. And I was um, able to work with, so many other amazing practitioners and, and learn from them and uh, we would all sort of work together for the benefit of um, the person coming in that they leave they leave well equipped to go back into the world um, and implement it love it yeah. yeah a multidisciplinary approach to well-being is is really the only way isn't it it's right like, there's no one thing that fixes everything do you know what I mean no yeah, for sure. So, so you mentioned Thailand and, and like basically uh, when you were in Thailand, you, you started picking up all the plastic bottles that were, that were lying around on the beach. So I'm kind of guessing that's where your, your interest in the whole sort of plastic scene and kind of sustainability sort of kicks off. Yeah, I'd always um, used reusables and more from a health point of view. So um, I learned quite uh, young about how um, plastics can leach and affect the endocrine system. And I had a friend that had a massive fibroid removed that was like the size of maybe a tennis ball or something in her stomach. And they reported that it was from um, drinking all out of all her plastic water bottles. And that really wow. freaked me out. And I was wow. super young when I heard about that. And it wasn't really a thing or, I mean, didn't even have a phone or anything back then. So it was just a word of mouth kind of thing. And so I changed to stainless steel and glass immediately. And then when I was living over there, I just, it was on the beach, all this rubbish. And I've always just been a conscious person and not want, why would you, why would you throw that on the ground when you can like dispose of it properly? It just didn't make sense mm. to me. And so I was picking it up and that's when it, um, it started to, and, and most people get this when you travel, you see outside of your, you know, clean town where you are lucky to live, where, you know, the rubbish gets picked up and things like that. And then you go to towns where it doesn't and it's sort of thrown in your face and you're like, wow, is this happening in more places? Um, and I'm always uh, been the kind of person going, okay, I've been super sensitive to that kind of stuff. I'm like, what can I do? And, um, and I guess that was just a tab that opened in my brain for later to come together for, for Mobot. Hmm. Yeah. There's, there's just way too many reasons now, if you put it all together to, you know, to, to cut back on plastics, isn't it? Like, right. I mean, endocrine, the, the aesthetic of it lying on beaches, you know, all these things, it's just quite ridiculous um, mm. that, that, that it's gotten to this point. It's unbelievable. But maybe you could just tell us a bit more about the sort of endocrine system. How, what, what actually happens there with, with plastics? It's the, is it the mimics the, um, oh gosh, now you're going to trump me, phytoestrogens, is that? Um, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so it, it mimics estrogen. So I think they call it phytoestrogen. And forgive me if I don't get the words right, they didn't come back correctly when my brain repaired itself. Um, and so it starts to send the hormone, uh, send your hormones out of, out of balance. And usually when that happens, I mean, if anyone's ever, and, and men can have it too, like get a hormonal imbalance. I mean, even if you have a drop in testosterone, that can mess with you quite, quite badly. So um, they, they say that it's um, mimicking that and that's a big cancer causing, um, particularly for women, for breast cancer and ovarian cancer. 
yeah it's so scary. Made, yeah it's super scary eh, craig um we actually spoke with this uh, this lady on our podcast her name was emily penn and um she she holds these expeditions that she takes um a woman around the world on on these yachts and, and massive boats and uh they basically research all the plastic that is like out there and there's basically these she, these gyres which are, are just like ocean like uh, sorry islands of plastic and she said the one was like seven kilometers long or something craig wasn't it, it was like or was it a thousand it was i mean it was, it was like a thousand it was a thousand yeah it was like a thousand kilometers long it was like just i mean it's it's so bad like you know what we're kind of doing to to the environment and the scary yeah. thing is that they, she also mentions like only i don't know what the percentage is but it's like what we see is only like a mm. tiny percentage of how much plastic there is in the ocean and stuff which is the microplex plastics and things which is yeah it's just like really i don't know like it's, it feels like we drowning in it in some way isn't it Oh, big time. It's uh, like they say you're eating almost a, a credit card a, a year if you're, you know, eating fish and things like that. It's, um, wow. it's gotten ridiculous and it's unfortunate that because um, some people don't see it and it's not literally in their backyard. The rubbish man's picking up saying he's recycling yeah. it and dumping it and they're sending it offshore and they're dumping it somewhere else that, you know, out of, out of sight, out of mind. But, you know, people need to become more aware of not just how it affects the environment, it is affecting your immediate health. If it sits, like they go, oh, but I just grabbed the bottle from the fridge. It's cold. It hasn't been in the sun. That bottle left Asia or Fiji. It sat on a dock. It sat on a ship. It sat on another dock. It sat on another truck. And now it's in the fridge cold, but it's sat in the sun for how long to get to you? What's going on? Like we don't know. And that's the thing. And I would rather not risk it. You know, I was just thinking about now, we, we spoke to an, an, another amazing woman from Australia recently, Jacinta McDonald, and, and she was saying well, she actually takes people and her own kids to, to Africa and places to, for them to see the thing, like the witness poverty and stuff, so that they have an, a better understanding. And just hearing you speak now, it almost we should almost take expeditions and kids to like see a landfill or like I don't know, see some of these places because like you say, I feel so far removed from it sometimes. You don't see it, but right. it doesn't mean it's not there. And we should, be, we should be saying, listen, this is the reality and actually witness what it's like. Eh? Exactly. There's a, um, uh, what we call our role models or ambassador that we work with, Alison Teal, and she's been sort of coined the phrase of in, yeah, female Indiana Jones. And she's out there, she grew up, yeah, with her dad was a photographer for National Geographic, I think, and a mama yoga instructor, and they travelled the world. So she grew up in the world, and then ended up on a show called Naked and Afraid. And the island she was on, um, they had to keep clearing the plastic to film. And then, you know, long story short, she's ended up making her mission to uh, expose it and try and shift people's awareness around. She travels around the world, bringing awareness to how bad it is, where it is, and just sort of show the cycle of it. And uh, she's been phenomenal in what she does. She, she needs way more, um, I think, public promotion for what she does. She does a, a really great job of a top and um, tries to make a topic that, people don't really want to look at because it's ugly, uh, yeah. kind of exciting and fun, which is cool. Hmm. Yeah. That's the key. Yeah. It sounds like a lady that we need to speak to, I think. hundred <laughs> percent. She's amazing. Yeah. yeah. But isn't it interesting? Like um, there's so many things in this world that we don't see, you know, and we kind of like blase about it. Like, you, you know, the, obviously the plastic, but then I guess say when it comes to factory farming and the meat we eat and I don't know, all other things are like how a lot of other people, food is produced. Um, I actually remember my dad once telling me he went to this, um, to, uh, this, this, there's this factory in South Africa called all gold and they literally make the best tomato sauce in the world. Like seriously, I've never tasted tomato sauce better anywhere. <laughs> and he came back the night, the, the night after going there and he's like, I'll never eat tomato sauce again in my entire life <laughs> because he saw how it was made. You know what I mean? And I think, uh, yeah, there's so much that we don't turn a blind eye, blind eye to things, but we just like, we don't know, you know, and uh, if we knew, we probably wouldn't do a lot of things. Mm. Oh, definitely. Entrepreneurialism is probably one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's for sure. So, so talking about entrepreneurialism, <laughs> if I can say the word right, um, 
there's this great convergence, I guess, of, of your interests and, and stuff, which, which happened in, in 2012. And, you know, I guess you combine your, your love of water, your, your, your hate of plastic and uh, your love of um, SMR and trigger therapy. And you, you designed a product for people that they didn't really know that they needed yet. So, so maybe you want to tell us a bit about that, how it came about and, and what it actually is. Yeah, so as I was sort of mentioning before, I'm a little bit excuse intolerant. So I was um, treating athletes at, a, at an event and I just came back from um, Thailand. So I would work um, four weeks sort of in Thailand uh, doing what I love and I would walk, work four weeks uh, in the mines in Australia as a surveyor. Uh, earning money to afford to do what I love. Oh. And so I was um, uh, treating people at this event and most of the athletes were, you know, I, um, I couldn't fit the foam roller in my bag. I have, so, I have so much gear now, I couldn't fit it on. Um, it's too big, it's too cumbersome, I didn't have time. Um, do, you have, do you have water, do you have this? It was just like, felt like constant for the day. And uh, it was that night that I was sort of walked home with all my gear. And I just remember thinking, I'm like, there's got to be a better way in the sense that if I had to put a visual to it, I think about um, Jim Carrey in Almighty God when all the sticky notes like appear. <laughs> That's what it felt like of every excuse. I'm like, make it stop. <laughs> I was probably only six people, but... Um, <laughs> and, uh, and that's when it sort of came to me and I, I, I remember it clear as day. It was sort of... It's, Felt like a lightning bolt, and I. This was uh, this is like my fifth business. I've been coming up with ideas for years. This is what I love to do. I like to problem solve. Not all of them worked out, uh, but they're a great experience, a learning experience. So, when I got this idea, I was like, Oh, oh God, that that might work. I, I think I, I snuck over to the computer because I believe in energy that once you put it out there, someone else <laughs> might grab it. So I was like, Don't say it. <laughs> snuck over to the computer. I was on it for hours Googling, going, someone's got to have done it. They've got to have patented these two things, need to live together for, you know, for not just for athletes, but for wellness. And no one had done it. And I was just uh. like, holy moly. Okay. So um, I came up with the name, the, tra uh, the tagline, pretty much like designed it there on the spot. And uh. um was like, okay, so need to find factories and do patents. And I was like, sometimes I feel like you're guided a little bit. And I was like, okay. And then we started searching on uh, Alibaba, went to Asia, um, found factory, went to um, LA, found a lawyer, uh, filed patents. And nine months later, we did a test launch with um, our first prototype, which just so you know, that's fast. <laughs> yeah, that is yeah. fast, yeah. super fast. Wow. Yeah. 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 So, so, so maybe you can just explain like what it actually is because it's a great, um, yeah. 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 It's, um, it's a hundred percent recycled stainless steel water bottle with a permanent covering that is, uh, uh high, high density, um, EVA foam, non-toxic EVA foam so that you can dig in uh, deep into trigger points and, and travel and roll and hydrate. And so it comes with a straw so it's easier to, to sip and uh, take in hydration consistently over the day. And there's three different sizes and realistically the only difference is they cover less surface area. There's no you know, massive, there's no um, scientific studies saying that it has to be a certain length or anything like that. Mm. I've used golf balls before, so it's kind of, it can be a little bit personal. Um, and most of them are just, you know, there's, uh, I'm trying to convert it now, 18 ounce is 500 mils and I think 27 ounce is 700 mils and uh, the 40 <laughs> ounce is 1.2 litres. <laughs> just for all the all the listeners out there and and, and how, how actually strong are those because you know like there's some big uh, guys i guess and you know like can you put like your full body weight on those oh yeah i've done everything but run it over um we've had yeah. a couple of really big rugby guys take it home and they they had to be a few hundred pounds for sure. <laughs> and uh, I remember the first time I gave it to him and I was like, can you go home and do this? Cause I don't want to know. <laughs> and he came back the next day. He's like, bro, works. <laughs> I was like, it's not dinted. It's totally fine. All right, we're good. <laughs> wow, weird. So that was the fun way of testing it in the beginning. Um, but stainless steel, you can't break it. You will dint it or it might like uh, sound like it's going to pop or anything, but it's, it's, 
near impossible to, to break it. And then with the added sort of insulation and layer of the high density foam sort of protects it. But most mm. of the time, when people are laying down or sitting on it, it's not their full body weight anyway. So yeah. I've even had like full guys jump on it to try and make a dent. And um, that may be the only way, but most people just putting parts of their body on it anyway. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. And stainless steel is that, uh, so first of all, recycled. Um, and it's also stainless steel. Maybe just tell us a little bit, is that much more, is that more preferable to, to some other, uh, well, it's definitely plastic. Is it, There's nothing leaching into the water. Is that right? Right, exactly. And so we use um, recycled stainless steel because as far as, as much as possible, you know, being able to use something that's, um, you know, being able to re repurposed is, is really good. Um, and some of them used to be lined with a, a toxic liner. Ours are electro polish finish, so there's no liner, so there's nothing toxic. Um, I, in my opinion, you know, glass is one of my first choices, but unfortunately it's not only heavy, it's a little bit dangerous, breakable, things like that. So it's good to use around the house, um, but traveling with it or even like, put, you know, daring to put your body on it, that kind of thing uh, wouldn't work out. So, and stainless steel um, is one of the most, I think, recycled and recyclable products on the planet. So recycling more of that. So when we get these and if it, if it didn't work out and they weren't so good, we can still recycle and try again. <laughs> yeah, <it's awesome. laughs> oh, classic. Uh, they, so, they are, yeah, they are actually like really beautiful, um, you know, um, what do you call them? Items, I would say. But uh, I, I can imagine like around the gym, uh, people are like, hey, what the hell is that? I want one of those. It, it must be like catching on quickly, I'm sure. It's funny. I had one girl uh, tell me, I can't take this to the gym anymore. I was like, why not? She's like, too many people stop me during my workout to ask me what it is and where to get it. Oh, no, 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 no. That's the point. Yeah. <laughs> She's yeah. like, they're interrupting my workout. I went, are you single? Maybe you get a date. <laughs> um, but we're going to start soon sort of mobot moments or mobot stories. I hear so many stories. It's such a conversation starter. And, and that's realistically that's cool. like for me, um, when I started this, I, I love building communities. I love being around the community and seeing people people being able to like free themselves not only of an injury or a trauma but being able to connect with others in a like-minded way because technically under the surface we're all suffering in some way we've got our own thing that we're going through and if we can just connect in a way that you know shows a side of ourselves that doesn't have to wear a mask and that's what I loved um, about this when I created that was very intentional on my part to try and create something that was not only attractive to look at um, but gave tangible motivation and that you, you would want to go what is that you, you would, it drives people and it still shocks me even though that was my intention to the to this day that people um, behave that way about it and they're so attracted to it and um, it's it's been pretty exciting yeah, it, it, it's super cool. Well done. So I just want you, you, you must feel pretty proud though, like with what you've designed. It's it's pretty great kit, and also you've uh, you've created this great community around it. So you know you, you must feel yeah you know, pretty proud of yourself. Yeah, I mean, the, getting um, a new product uh, manufactured and to market, and then you know internationally patented is is very difficult and um i definitely don't take it lightly when i have to think back on it but when i look at it now the community that i've built the team that i have um that is what motivates me and inspires me every day to see them coming together and um in a way that is not just oh i, I like to be hydrated or roll out in a, in a, a sort of overall, overall wellness, they're looking at everything from how can I improve and then how can I help someone else? And, you know, if we're always looking to improve ourselves and share it, I mean, how can we kind of go wrong? I love that. You can totally get the feeling of your whole life story in this, you know, like you've been through a lot and the, the, even the, like the heart sticker and it is so, it's so much more than just, a bottle with that, you know what I mean? And, and that it totally comes through. And I think that's why it's so attractive because there's this sort of energetic thing to it that you've, you've put so much love and, and hard work into it. And it's, it's really cool that I really, really like that. So talking about just, you know, you know, being an entrepreneur and, and just being brave and that in, in 2014, you jumped on a, a plane to start a new life in the U S and, um, all you have is two suitcases and you, you knew only two people living there too. So that must, you know, that's a real brave thing to do. So tell us about that journey. 
gosh, I look back now and I think, what was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I was. I think you have to have those. I felt so deeply um, inspired and passionate about what I was doing. And it was one of the first time I, part, times I had an idea. I didn't really tell anyone. I felt um, I, almost to the point where sometimes when it's exciting to tell people to keep them, uh, help them keep you on track and, and uh, pursue it. Like, you know, you tell someone you're going to run a marathon, then you sort of have to live up to it kind of thing. I was at the point where I just did not want anyone to tell me I couldn't do it. And, you know, you face that a lot with different businesses and different things. And uh, for once I was just like, no, I'm, I'm just doing it and I'm going to see see what happens and I, I'm super grateful to have been that naive <laughs> 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 and um, was like I'm no one in Australia I may as well be no one in America there's a much bigger pond over there how can I go wrong oh, it, went, it went very wrong um, <laughs> before it came very right but all those uh, all those lessons have been so valuable into making me the sort of better uh, leader entrepreneur um and human that i am now and i wouldn't change it for the world mm -hmm. yeah what kind of things were going wrong like what 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 was the what um, were some of the tough times of make, moving country like that and i think that was more it the under i'd moved to several different countries before but not another not so much another western country so there was an assumption on my part that things would be similar because we spoke english and um that was wrong and <laughs> uh, understanding sort of how it worked. I mean, just from visas and credit and um, things like that, there was a lot of difficulty, a lot more difficulty there than I expected. Um, and then the cost, the, the cost of, you know, starting a product and being based with a factory in Asia. Then I was in Australia, my other business part, uh, my business partner was in Australia, sorry. And I was in America and trying to sort of coordinate that at the same time. So, build and grow a brand and a community from scratch with a product that was not working out quite yet. Um, Cause the first prototypes that we released were all handmade and we we're like, okay, we can't continue like that. And there's still quite a high element of, you know, being handmade still, but we had to move into like bigger mass production type things, which comes with its own sort of challenges. Um, mm -hmm. So I would say the challenges of um, being remote while, uh, you know, your factories in, in Asia, and uh, and then living in a, in a new country where um, thing you know things are just a lot um, done a lot differently, and it's sort of a bit naive in the sense that you watch a movie uh, and you think you know America. <laughs> 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 Although I will say the Valley Girls are real, and I was shocked. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, that's so funny. And in Lonnie. terms of the, 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 the traveling, like, or the, the product um, work that you had to do for uh, in, in Asia, did you go through a company that kind of that put you in contact with a business that did that? Or did you go yourself and vet a bunch of people? Or uh, that, That's what's funny. It wasn't until years later that people were like, you know that there's agents that do that. It's like, what? Yeah. Really? Um, I think part of it is just the way my mind thinks. I, unfortunately, uh, it can come in handy for some things, but I just didn't trust anyone. And I was like, if it's going to get done well, right, quickly, and to you know, um, to the price I wanted, I need to negotiate it. I need to be involved in every step of the way. Um, so I didn't really uh, think about it. And I think because Australia is so close to Asia. It wasn't a fear at all to go over there. It felt very familiar and I'd been around it a lot, um, you know, quite a lot. So it wasn't uh, intimidating um, at all. And um, I've always, uh, prior to doing this, I was uh, also a flight attendant for, for Qantas and I had been to Asia quite a bit and uh, had become known for... <laughs> <laughs> as one of the most ruthless negotiators for all, you know, all the, at the markets for all the, you know, <laughs> DVDs and things like that. So they're like, oh, you know, we don't want to talk to you anymore because I was like very ruthless in my negotiations. So I, I took that skill with me and uh, went and negotiated factories. We got rejected by, 
a lot in saying that I never told them what they were doing because I knew about how bad the copies were and I mm. wanted to protect myself before the patent sort of got through. So they just thought they were making a smaller foam roller. They did not know it was a bottle. They did not know the design or anything like that. And they, all I wanted them to do was learn how to do it onto stainless steel. And um, a lot of them were just like, it can't be done. It can't be done. And we finally found one factory that were prepared to, to give it a go um, and so they really helped us uh, get started and then at the at the 11th hour I was like oh take out that insert I'm sending you bottles and so by the time we launched they didn't even know what they were making so it was only about four weeks of them ma actually making the product huh. and so I was like yay to market before like they had time to even know what it was. Oh, oh, wow, wow. It's, it's 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 quite it's quite sad I guess how you know, you, you can't launch a product without it getting copied even before, you know what I mean? It's just like, wow, yeah. is, this, is that what the world is really coming to? Um, I started in Taiwan because uh, from all my research, um, they tend to honor patents um, a lot more. And so I started there, it's a little more expensive, but they're also known for their EVA foam. So that's where I started. And it was the best start that we could have had. We didn't have our first copy come to market until... 2016 which is not something they'll probably ever go in the in the tabloids or anything but that's quite that's no um you know that's not easy to do when you do something that now there's copies everywhere um but we had a good two years of um our extensive r&d which was very difficult before the first one came to market hmm. and and and, and non-disclosure agreements like are they do they not mean anything really or <laughs> um not sure. <laughs> Depends yeah. what language they're in, maybe. Um, no, we actually have um, very strong uh, defendable patents now. So we have a partner in China that's taken on uh, distribution and helping chase that down. So obviously, mo all of our copies come out of China. So we're hot on the trail of, um, of shutting all the copies down with our partner in China now, which is super exciting. Wow. That's great news. There's so many lessons in there. Wow, it's, it's fascinating. <laughs> you know what I mean? You can definitely write a book about it one day, that's for sure. Um, but, but, you know, so you basically, you're, you're in America, you're setting up your business, um, and then tragedy strikes, actually, and it's, uh, it, it, it's just through a, um, an, a game of touch rugby, basically, you know, that you're probably playing every single afternoon. So mm. can you tell us what happened there? Yeah, I started for pretty much for um, community and, and uh, stress relief. I started playing um, touch rugby on the beach with the, the boys down in Santa Monica. And I was playing with them, you know, two, three times a week uh, for years. And I was not new to the game. I grew up playing it and loved it. And yeah, this one casual Sunday... Um, I don't know, this guy maybe just caught the ball in such a fashion that he thought he was on the pitch in Eden Park against the All Blacks <laughs> and saw me as, I don't know, a, a target to take down. I don't know. I, it, it's such a freak thing because, you know, no one really hears about someone having such a, uh, ending up with such an injury from a touch rugby game. Um, but anyway, he, he ran into me and knock me into next week and I I landed pretty heavily the boys were like all we saw was your feet up in the air yeah. and on the back of my head and the ricochet effect um from oh, like serious whiplash I guess um ended up causing frontal lobe hippocampus and amygdala uh damage and I ended up I lost memory cognitive speech like taste smell, um, vision problems, uh, emotional problems, a lot of pain. It was kind of like fire ants were in my head trying to get out all the time. And I mean, if you can think about any injury you have, like even knee or ankle, when that inflammation there is there, it's, it's so, um, it, it's so painful. So in your head that, you know, controls everything, your computer, so everything just sort of switched off. Um, no appetite, no, no triggers to drink water, to eat, to, to do anything. So it was, uh, I didn't know what country I was in. I didn't know why I was here or what I was doing. Um, I was a real life Dory. My memory was a, a couple of minutes. No ways. Oh, wow. Mm. Wow. That's crazy. How, how long did that sort of carry on for? Um, the worst of it was probably a good nine to 12 months. Um, what? Yeah. And I would say you know, almost full recovery. There's things that I may never get back and I just deal with now. 
was at least two years. Yeah. Wow. And, and so like, they must have been so shocked because did, did you have symptoms like almost straight away? Like when you were lying there or, or did um, they sort of... Did the boy said I stood up and made a joke. Uh, I don't remember, but it sounds like me, so that's good. Um, <laughs> just still uh, following through on my comedy, so that's good. Um, <laughs> but I do remember it was a couple of hours later when we usually go for lunch after and uh, sitting there with everyone and everything just became blurry. I started to feel like I was going to throw up. I, I felt very confused and felt like everyone was speaking another language that I couldn't understand. And, wow. you know, I uh, just was like, I, and, and this has come down to awareness thing, especially for women. We're not really educated on like a concussion like that. Like, especially men playing contact sports, you guys are a lot more aware. So you would be able to go, oh, hey, I got hit like this. I got this. I probably have a concussion. I should do X. For me, I was like, I must be dehydrated and hormonal. Um, I'll go home and go to bed. Oh, and no way. I knew enough about them, but not for it to happen to me. It hadn't happened to me like that before. So mm. I went home and I went to bed and um, super lucky, woke up the next day. Mm. And one of the guys that had been on the um, uh, playing in the game with me the day before was coming around to uh, pre-organize to help me with some work and a delivery. And he said that he turned up and he said, I was walking around in circles. I was not making sense. I was dropping things. I was really agitated. I was repeating myself. Or he said, you were, I was so confused. And he's like, I think that you have a, have a concussion. And uh, from there, just uh, followed up with uh, friends that were doctors because they didn't have insurance. And mm. they checked in on me to make sure, you know, no bleed on the brain, that kind of thing. And because, you know, it's a bit of a joke over here for uh, us uh, immigrants, I guess. Don't t send me to the hospital. No doctor. I don't care if my legs cut off. Put me on a plane and send me back to Australia. It would be cheaper. So um, <laughs> didn't go to the doctor. And um, and when my friends like visited, they're like, okay, so it's quite bad. Um, but typically, you know, you have to wait a few months to see if it gets better, what it's going to do. And then three months later, I went to a proper doctor in, in an office and uh, he did all the tests and he's like, yeah, it's, it's a big one. It's probably going to be about two years for recovery. Wow. That's crazy. Wow. You, you know, what? I don't think uh, you, you mentioned men knowing about concussion a bit more, but actually it's actually quite shocking. Even doctors and stuff, there's a way too little known about concussion mm. and awareness. It's, it's getting better slowly, but surely. But um, on the, on the, on the field side, I still hear it all the time. Like youngsters have a big knock. And the, the coaches are still like, oh, yeah, um, you know, two weeks or one week off. And it's just not enough. Like people, oh, and, and also the thing that people don't realize is that it doesn't always have, to, you don't always have to have a massive amount of symptoms to have had a concussion. Like yours must have been really bad, obviously. But, um, you know, it's a massive thing that people need to be understanding more because it can happen from touch rugby. It's not all, you know, rugby games and it, it can be other things and, so I'm glad that you're bringing this up because it's, it's, um, it's actually very important for, for parents and for coaches and things like that to have some understanding of because it's that serious, you know. If you yeah. take a second knock, it's really bad. Mm, yeah, exactly. and, and Craig, there's actually, I don't know if you've seen the movie, uh, but it's with uh, Will Smith. Oh, I love that movie. I, I think, what, is it called Concussion or is it called? I think it is. Yeah, and it's about American football and yeah. basically. The South African doctor? Yes. You, oh no, was he South yeah. African? Yeah, yeah. Or, or Nigerian. I can't remember. But, um, but yeah, basically, I guess what happens is these guys are playing American football and they, they have clashes of the head all the time, not just in, in matches, but during training. And um, the long-term effects of it are like serious, serious, um, you know, like a like mix of serious issues. Um, I think they call it uh, CTE, where they're having so these. Um, it's got a big long name. People can Google it. Um, I'm not going to say it, um, but it is having the long-term effects that since that movie, uh, which I don't think the NFL wanted it to come out, um, more and more people, more and more guys and even wives are, that have divorced husbands have come forward sort of talking about what they've gone through after from these repeated head, head injuries without any support or a break for recovery and what you mentioned before about the awareness about it and it's only since I've been through it is uh gosh how how more common it is than um than anyone's like talking about and that I think it's difficult because 
every single person is different. And so every, everyone that I met, there's, and like we've said before, there's no one way to treat anything, but there's not, there's almost no two people that had the same, um, exact same uh, problems after a concussion. They're like varying depending on what you had going on before or like the kind of person you are, what, or where it hits or where it's damaging. And so it's really, really hard to, um, just give one protocol for a head That's injury. It's mm. crazy. I actually had a patient that was playing tennis and she had a, and she got hit by the tennis ball and it was a serious concussion. And like, wow. you know, there's another example. You, you, it's not in the, you're not in this environment that you would expect. So you don't think it's concussion initially, which is, which is pretty crazy. And, and actually talking about that Gareth, what you, that movie and stuff, like people are actually saying that the whole CTE story, uh, Lonnie is like, um, almost as bad as smoking was because in some ways people are covering it up. They don't really want to accept that mm. this is actually a reality. And, and, uh, so people are suppressing this information like big time because, uh, yeah, but it's, which is pretty crazy, but, um, it, down the track they they reckon with, you know, the depression rates and all that, that comes from these sportsmen and women, um, it will eventually become apparent how, how it was suppressed, you know, for a long time because the clubs don't want it, um, but yeah, so, so, uh, you know, after this, this event, Lani, you, a lot happened. You, you, as you mentioned, it was a, it was a big recovery, but you almost lost your company, uh, and, and some of your friends to, um, your ex-husband and some friends came from Australia, uh, to kind of help you out. As you mentioned, you didn't have the health insurance. Um, tell us a bit more about the recovery. I I'm super lucky that I was involved in sort of the rehabilitation recovery industry beforehand and was already working with um, a lot of doctors uh, locally that were selling our product and working with their patients. So um, I had a lot of contacts that found out about it that were super helpful and um, they put like a hyperbaric oxygen chamber in my, in my room. And so, I mean, that in itself brought my memory back probably 30, 40% in about four months of mm. doing that, you know, many hours a day. Um, the unfortunate thing was that they had to put stickers on the top of it to, uh, they would put me in there. I would argue about going in there. So if I fell asleep or I would realize why I'm in here, I'll get me out of here, that kind of thing, I would freak out. You really shouldn't undo a hyperbaric oxygen chamber really quickly oh. and try and escape because that could damage your ears. So there would be like stickers going, no, you're meant to be in here. Um, this has happened, that kind of thing. I, I should have taken out shares and sticky notes, I think. Um, <laughs> The recovery process, yeah, I think um, because my ex-husband was my business partner at the time and so he um, obviously cared about me but had a vested interest in um, making sure that the business is running. So he came over to help take over that part and then he couldn't do it on his own um, and, and take care of me. So one of my best friends from high school came over as well and um, – wow. I don't really remember a lot of it. I hear a lot of stories and so I can repeat, you know, the stories about what people tell me I did or um, how I was acting. I remember, unfortunately, a lot of the, the pain, um, it, like that memory doesn't leave you. I think that's in your body, uh, not in your mind. But there was, I've uh, always been a hard worker and um, never one to settle for something when there's a problem. And so I would have moments of clarity and realize there was a problem. So I was always making lists when I did. And luckily, because then I would find them when I wasn't and then I'd find reminders in a cupboard or I'd find reminders everywhere like, you're okay, you're going through this. Uh, this is what you need to do. Don't forget this. Um, so it was kind of, uh, I guess you could compare it to maybe a, a, an Alzheimer's moment where you just, you know, uh, just check out. You're just um, not not there for, for moments in time. I was driving off to West Hollywood and shouldn't have been driving, but I forgot that I wasn't meant to drive and I uh, find myself in strange hotels trying to get into uh, hotel rooms for no reason and then um, someone would have to be called and I had no idea how I got there or why I was there. I valeted my car and everything. Wow. That's so That's hectic. Crazy. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do do you? I mean, do you think like the recovery would have been a hell of a lot easier if you had gone like you know you hadn't had those three months where you hadn't actually gone to hospital? 
it's interesting um, because it was also in uh, recovery groups as well to try and it was uh, to talk to people that were going through something similar because I still looked pretty much the same. So it was very hard to see me as this uh, kind of almost emotionless uh, or emotional aggressive person that just wasn't that like a, you know, a week or a month ago. So a lot of people um, just, I guess, took it personally when I would become aggressive, which I don't blame them. I, I can totally see why you would kind of freak out. So um, I went to a couple of um, groups and so there was a lot of people with concussion and recovering from strokes there. And um, it sort of, I, what was the question again? No, do, do you think that, um, you know, like your recovery would have been, I guess, maybe a bit smoother, but easier if you had oh. gone to the hospital earlier on? So these guys went to the hospital and that was going to be my point that the, the people that I saw in these groups were um, put on medication really quickly. And I'm anti that. I'm, I'm so glad that part did not get knocked out of my brain. I was like, I don't take drugs. Mm. Let's do it naturally. And um, they, they improved a lot quicker than me. And I must admit, I was super frustrated by seeing how they were improving and I wasn't, and um, especially emotionally. So there was obviously antidepressants and different things. Mm. What I did notice over the long term is that um, I started to get better and maintain a, a, a more sustainable um, recovery mm. that um, I put down to that my I allowed my brain to have the time to repair itself rather than putting yes. in a mask or something kind of you know fake so they got better seemed to get better sooner um whereas I didn't and then now on the other end not only are they trying to get off the drugs they didn't have that time in the beginning for it to learn how to you know repair itself how it needs mm -hmm. to which it can the, the brain is amazing so um I don't, I don't know because I might, if I had gone, I might've been put under pressure to, yeah. you know, maybe go to hospital and take drugs. So, um, it's, it's a good question. I can't answer. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, did you use, did you use your mobot while you were recovering? <laughs> oh, for sure. Like hydration is such a huge part of that. Like the brain, it, it needs so much. And, um, and my body was in so much pain so much pain. I, I probably threw more than I actually used. <laughs> They're quite the weapon if, uh, if it comes, if comes to shove. <laughs> <laughs> That's classic. So, so every cloud has a, has a silver lining and you, and you said that there's sort of um, your brain injury cracked your heart open. So what did you actually mean by that? Well, I've always thought that I was working towards and I when you go on these journeys of self discovery and you sort of have adversity young like that that's the goal is like to get back to the purity of the person that you are that uh, you know is open uh, and willing to you know put yourself out there so I really thought at that stage after yoga instructor all these things that I was doing that and meditating and I was doing that um but it seems like the underneath it all that I'd had such a, a huge trauma um, that I'd really shut it off uh, to really letting it in and then letting letting it out sort of thing. And this is, you know, a bit hippie dippity, woo woo, you know, la la, la lani land. But um, uh, it made me see, uh, put less pressure on myself because I couldn't. And I, this sounds, might sound a little bit, uh, backwards, which I'm dyslexic, so that's fine. Um, but it made me um, go into things and get things mega wrong and embarrass myself, be stupid. Because um, I was always the kind of person that uh, would avid researcher, had a, a fantastic almost photographic memory because I trained myself to have it, have it. It was one of my biggest assets and I loved it. Um, probably why I got divorced. My ex-husband hated it. <laughs> so you remember everything. I remember um, that day. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> and then, um, so once that was gone, I felt like a big part of my identity was gone. And, uh, and it was an identity crisis because without a memory, you even don't even have a personality, a sense of humor. You don't know what to wear. It, it was a major identity crisis. So I had to get back. I had to rebuild and just even learning to know what food I liked, what clothes I liked to wear. What I did, I swear I didn't listen to music or laugh for, for months. I didn't even know what, and that's just not who I am. So it was quite, it was, it was quite weird to, um, what, I've forgotten your question again. 
I was coming back to a point. I'm bringing it back. I promise. What was the question again? Um, what did I ask again? <laughs> what, <laughs> was, uh, so, what, so how how did the brain injury actually get your oh my heart, heart cracked open? Yeah. That's See, my heart is so deep. We've had to go around this like big path to try and find it. Um, this is great. Uh, I don't know if we have time to tell you about the dream. I uh, do. You want me to tell you about the dream? Yeah, why not? <laughs> okay, so this is this is probably going too far, but whatever. Um, so I woke up from a dream where um, I had I was sitting on the side of like a rocky shore in like a full wetsuit, booties, and everything, waiting for the tide to go out. The tide went out. I had to go down with like and you know almost like shuck like an oyster, go over these deep and um, you know sharp rocks and oysters, and then I was down there and tied like way out and shucking and then opening it and then opened it up and my heart was in there <laughs> oh, what? and I was like oh my god I I had just buried it so deep that I assumed by everything that I layered into my life that I was <laughs> living and being open-hearted because that's what I wanted but I hadn't actually like connected with the real thing that I, I buried it so deep to protect it all those years ago and it did its job. It did a great job. It protected me and it kept me strong. And, you know, that was where a lot of my trust issues and stuff like that came from. And I was like, Oh no, like, and it, it was amazing. This dream was so vivid and it was in perfect condition. Like it hadn't been used. <laughs> I was like, Oh my God, I need to put that bump back in. And so after that dream, um, I went and saw, you know, um, some friends and uh, healers and things like that about it and started working on the, on the path to like connecting myself. Hello. Hello. <laughs> My phone, none of it was charging and it just... Oh all turned off so i'm sorry i'm like got my eye on it now i know there's not much longer left and i don't know i feel like i cut off at a very interesting time yeah. <laughs> it was, a bit of a, it was. we'll, we'll yeah, just tell I, our listeners you're like oh yeah well you'll have to uh go speak to lani for the, the, <laughs> the, the, the lock, closing the loop on this amazing story yeah <laughs> talk about cliffhanger <laughs> right, <laughs> oh, oh gosh classic. um yeah, do you know where I left off? Um, yeah, so my heart in this dream uh, was uh, technically untouched and um, I guess just protected, which is a great metaphor for what most of us do. We build up these barriers and these walls and to try and protect ourselves. And I took it as that, going, okay, well, what is it going to take for me to, to really drop those down? And... Um, Interestingly enough, a lot of it had to do with uh, putting myself out there in the public more. Um, so like doing more comedy, doing more stand up because A, they were some of my biggest fears and I don't like to have big fears hold me back because I, I just I just don't like that space in my brain where I'm walking around with something that I'm afraid to do. I would love to like be able to just go, yeah, sure, I'll give that a go. Sure, you, your MC fell over and, uh, and can't talk. Sure, I'll do it. <laughs> that happens all the time. Um, and so I started pushing myself to, I mean, guess technically get rejected even more and putting myself out there. And I guess one of the best parts about that what, with the brain injury was that I didn't really care what people think thought because I would have no memory of it. So um, I went into things with a, a lot more uh, confidence that wasn't mine. And I've always, you know, uh, had a little bit of a um, problem with confidence. As well. I've always believed in myself, but the confidence was always a problem. And so I've always been trying to do things to get more confidence. And, and that's what the comedy has done for me. And inadvertently, that also pushed my, I guess, brain, like when you're working out a muscle, you, you know, you extend it, you break it, you let it repair and it's bigger and stronger. The comedy was kind of doing that to my brain, um, forcing me to be around loud, you know, loud laughter, lights and pressure and memory and testing me. And it would take me days to recover from, from oh. one set, from one six or seven minute set, um, if not a week. And, but that, um, I think is what helped me recover faster by constantly still using it and pushing those things that, that hurt it, hurt and make me. Un yeah, 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 exactly. Hey. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> the scenery. Sorry. <laughs> oh, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
this is my life. Uh, <laughs> Love it. I'm in my this car is... now because this is the best charger that would actually, none of them would connect or work. So um, I don't the... know if that's okay. The sound is okay or that. It's that actually, light... you're, you're actually, I'm going to disappoint you now. You, the second person to have done a podcast in the car. Yes. So we, you know, normally it, you'd think you'd be the first, but <laughs> another Australian too. Another yeah. Australian from the Goldie, actually. Yeah. I was yeah. actually just gonna do it in my car because I just pretty much feel like I do everything in my car. I was like, that's not right, Lana. You should be more professional. So uh, let's end on who I actually am. <laughs> there we go. That's amazing. <laughs> well, I mean, but you see, the universe will steer you the way it your route, like who you are, either way. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so Lani, listen, we'll, we'll just we'll just um, wrap it up here a little bit. So. Look, you are a an amazingly strong woman. I mean, you 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 put yourself in these situations, as you mentioned, like to that really challenge yourself and 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 go that extra mile to to get to that next layer to to operate at another level. And and that's yeah, it's just really it's really inspiring. Um, so thanks for sharing that with us. You've done so many amazing things, but. What, look, looking towards the future a little bit, what what are you most excited about uh, for the future? And uh, what have you got coming up? And then after that, maybe you can just tell us how people can get in touch with you and your products. I'm super excited about all the um, events and things that we've got going on with growing the company and you know more role models, more uh, community, more classes. Uh, it's super exciting. I love meeting with people. I love hearing people's stories and. Anytime I can have any kind of impact just makes my day. So that's super exciting for me personally. And yeah, the company is uh, going in leaps and bounds uh, internationally, not just in the US now. So we're excited to reveal some of those things. We should be in a, over, I think, 50, 50 stores. And uh, by the end of the year and 25 countries, we go into Bloomingdale's and Nordstrom in a couple of weeks. So there's some, there's some big things coming up, which is super exciting. We've got a, a couple of collaboration and partnerships that are doing their own uh, custom designs and stuff exclusive to them. So there's some pretty cool things coming up for the business as well. And uh, so I, I have my own Instagram, which is Lani underscore Cooper. Um, I just started it because uh, apparently it's a thing and I should get on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's been around one or two years. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So it's growing slowly, but it's, uh, it's been pretty cool. And then Mobot Nation is for the company. And so anyone that wants to go on there and see about either getting a Mobot or becoming an ambassador or role model and joining a community uh, can find out about events or classes or where we're going to be in that area and uh, hopefully roll with us soon. Mm, wow Great. that's a lot of exciting stuff coming up wow congratulations yeah. 25 countries that's that's incredible yeah. um yeah you must be super pumped for that um but it's no surprise because you've got such a great product um so so just uh, our last question uh, of the day is um that we like to ask all of our guests is what does being ridiculously human mean to you gosh being ridiculous for a start like not being afraid to be ridiculous and then obviously not being afraid to be human but I think it comes back to uh, finding the courage to be yourself, um, which can make you very uncomfortable and you have to get very intimate. And being, for me, being yourself is getting to know yourself because I feel like the masks and the layers we've been given by society or someone else isn't who we are. And that's why we feel so challenged or confused and not know what we want and going out and finding out what sometimes what you don't want is the best way to find out more about yourself and like cancel it off the list until you narrow it down to, you know, who you are and what you want and what fuels you and what drives you. And then it becomes much easier to be yourself because people's, I, I, I thrive on being authentic and honest and, and telling and sharing the truth, but it hasn't always been that way. And it's been a lot of self discovery. So I think, and I hope that I encourage others to see the ridiculous side and the honest and truthful side of me, that it would encourage them that they could put themselves out there and know that there's always going, you're always going to fall into the right tribe when you start to do that and own that, that there's always someone there for you. Mm. Well said, so well yeah. said. Very well said. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that. Seriously. So, um, honestly, uh, Lani, it's been such an amazing chat. Um, and, and just so cool to connect with you. Like just, I really enjoyed 
you know, our interactions before and the, with, you know, before we arrange the podcast and you, you, that, that authenticity just shines through. Seriously, you, you, you're such a happy lady. And uh, this just, it's, it's just so obvious just in the way you tell your story and, and through your smile and, and how you tell your story too. And seriously, what you've gone through as a person is like, is, is rather phenomenal, like um, throughout your whole life. And um, the, the theme that pops out for me is like, is, is courage, um, bravery, and um, just like, let's do it sort of thing, you know, and, and, um, and sort of manage whatever happens after that. Uh, and, and, and that's so that, but that's, that's like, <laughs> that's oh, dear, sorry. <laughs> um, but, but, but that's, but that's just so, I think so important, you know what I mean? And, and uh, especially for, for everyone in this day and age, you know, like we, we all kind of want to do something and we're all striving to do things and we're often fearful of doing it, but, um, but we, we must try and like, you know, use the lessons, I guess, from, from your life and from your story to just uh, not make us hold it, you know, not, not have those hold us back anymore. Um, and yeah, seriously, uh, I mean, you, you, you're such a fun lady and I feel like we, we've only just, you know, we've only just touched on so many things and there's so much stuff we could go deeper on. I know because I've listened to you on other podcasts and stuff, but, um, you know, it's always that challenge of like trying to fit in your amazing story and then going deep on certain things. Um, so hopefully this is just the start of, uh, you know, maybe uh, some future podcasts and, you know, some other podcasts in the future as well. So, um, thanks a lot. You're doing amazing, uh, amazing work. Uh, you're building an amazing community. I cannot wait to order my Mobot and take it around Asia with me when we go traveling. So that's going to be epic in South America. <laughs> so um, yeah, just uh, have yourself an, an awesome day. And thanks again for, for your great story. Thank you guys so much. It's, uh, it's always these feelings of tribal campfire. When you uh, emailed me and said, oh, it's just uh, not as much preparation. It's just going to be talking. Um, that is like, the best for, for me like there's not there's not a lot of that these days in my opinion where it's more sort of PR'd and you know very particular and be careful what you say and you know understand you don't want to offend people but at the end of the day if we want inclusion <laughs> and to be seen as who we are and people to turn up to be seen how can you not share truth over like just a conversation so I really love your podcast and what you're doing and uh, I'm really grateful that uh, I was introduced to you as also I think it was Karen, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> just briefly from my side, Lani, just exactly what Gary said, bravery really shows through in your story, but uh, interesting enough, also mental toughness. I know that's kind of a little bit ironic because you've, you know, been through this stuff, but you totally just, you know, push through tough situations because you know it, it, you come out the other side a stronger human being and that's just a great lesson it, like entrepreneurship life all these things are not easy and and that's part of your authenticity and your honesty which which we really love because um people love to to see the result and say oh look how well you've done but don't always understand that you've been through this massive process and i mean just look at your story what you've been through and you've you've used all these moments in your life as as learning opportunities and that's what separates people it's not the fact that you've been through stuff it's the fact how you choose to see the stuff that you've been through and i think that's you know really exude that um in, in a sort of natural way and you also said you know certain once or twice that things have been a bit woo woo and a bit and i i sort of disagree like i think you opening your heart and and um connecting with yourself and these are these are real fundamental things that people yeah. love to make, make maybe seem weird or whatever, but you know, I'm, I'm just grateful that you brought those things up because they, this is what it's all about at the end of the day. So once again, just from my side, thanks so much. I can't wait to order my Bobot here and ours as well. Um, and uh, there's a lot of people out this side of the world that will be into what you're doing as well. I just know it. And uh, so, yeah, so exciting. Thank you. No, thank you. That's uh, the first time I've publicly shared the the dream story, and uh, I I think it's awesome because we all have dreams, and we all mm. don't know what to do with them, and they all you know are trying to figure themselves out while we're asleep. So um, thank you for totally. 
uh, pointing that out, I will uh, re-correct the woo-woo and remove it from my vocab. <laughs> <laughs> oh, classic. Cool, cool stuff. stuff. Cool stuff. Um, well, cool. Thanks, you so, great. Yeah, that was really great. Thanks so much. So, right. Well, thank well, you, boys. Uh, enjoy yeah. the Rugby World Cup, and I'll talk to you Woo. soon. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, thanks for being so flexible as well. So, yeah. we really No, you it. too. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Amazing chat. Thank you so much. Have an awesome okay. day there as well. You yeah. too. Talk, have a good right. sleep. Oh, yeah. Thanks a lot. See you later. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye, bye, bye. 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 Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change, snow.